G'day, my name's Tony, and I may not look it, but I'm actually a giant nerd. And that means that when you generally, you folks are playing around with your kids or watching TV with your loved ones, I'm tinkering around with technology, all for your benefit. This time what I've decided to do is take on the challenge of creating a Proxmox cluster that supports high availability for Home Assistant. So what I've got here is a collection some would say an eclectic collection of old hardware. They're all uh, Lenovo ThinkPad laptops. Uh, the first one is a T430. Um, it has an i3 Intel CPU, 2.8 gigahertz, uh, 12 gig of RAM and a 300 gigabyte hard drive. And then contestant number two is a T450S, which also has an Intel CPU, but this time an i7, uh, 2.6 gigahertz processor, 20 gigabytes of RAM, 500 gigs of hard drive. Not a bad little machine. And then we have contestant number three, one of these things that does not look like the others. This is a Lenovo P50, and it has a Intel i7 CPU, uh, just the same as the T450S, 2.6 gigahertz uh, clock speed, 32 gig of RAM and a one terabyte hard drive. Now you may be thinking, but Tony is supposed to use matched hardware. And this is correct in a production environment. You should use matched hardware, but for this application, I don't think it's necessary. It works fine. Um, I haven't had any issues with it, so we will proceed. Uh, we also have three of these uh, Seagate portable hard drives. They're a one terabyte drive. And we're going to use those for our shared storage across all three laptops. Um, so I've broken this video up into several parts. The first part is how to set up Proxmox on a laptop, including disabling the lid switch so that when you close the lid, uh, so if you've got your laptop set up somewhere where you don't want the lid open, um, the laptop will keep running. Now, I did try to figure out how to make Proxmox work with the wireless interface, but I was unsuccessful. I spent quite a lot of time trying to do that. I spent, <laughs> went way down many rabbit holes. Um, so I've just decided to give up on it. So, uh, so what we're gonna do is show you how to set up Proxmox on a laptop, as I said, then uh, build the cluster of the three different laptops together, show you how to set up storage to take advantage of those clustered drives or the clustered uh, array. Then we'll build um, Home Assistant in a cluster, um, show you how to um, set it up so that it will automatically migrate between machines when there is a failure. Um, and we'll also set up um, Pi-hole if we get time. So as I say, we've broken this video up into several components. So you can take a pick which one you want to watch. If you already know how to install Proxmox, then you can skip that and just go on to how to um, set up high availability. Um, if you don't want to watch any of it, thanks for joining. See you later. <laughs> uh, but I hope you enjoy that. Please like, share and review. OK, first things first, let me point you to my website. If you happen to have uh, gone to uh, my video via YouTube, then you may not have found my website. Uh, on here, you'll find uh, some useful information, some things that I've built for Home Assistant. A couple of videos I've recorded, although it looks a little empty at the moment. Uh, I've done some ones on uh, how to connect Toyo devices to Home Assistant and things like that. And some other videos that you probably found in my channel. Uh, but I also wanted to point out some other websites uh, that I used to help me prepare this uh, tutorial. This first one is I went on to this dude's uh, YouTube clip. I watched this, this showed me how to install Debian from a boot image. His name's Tech Hut, which is a strange name for a person. He looks a bit like Zach Ganavalakis, I think. Uh, anyway, the video is quite informative. I've included a link, or will include a link on my website um, on the instructions that I will provide on how to do this. Uh, there is also a full step-by-step -step instructions, which is exactly the same as the process that I am following here uh, on this uh, computer for geeks, or computing for geeks, I should say, uh, website. The other thing you need, 
uh, is the download of the firmware. So this image I've already downloaded and I've already uh, set up. So uh, no need for me to show you how to do this, but I will include the link to this page so that you can download it yourself and install. Um, the installation process will be exactly the same going forward. The only other thing that I need to tell you is I'm using on my computer, uh, which you'll see in just a moment, I'm using VirtualBox and a VirtualBox uh, operating system instance. The reason I'm doing that is because if you've ever tried to build a tutorial on showing how to install an operating system on any kind of computer, you'll realize it's very, very difficult to get a meaningful image of uh, to show in a video. Um, if you try to capture it from a phone, it's not very good quality. Uh, you either need some very sophisticated hardware to capture the uh, graphics output of the laptop when it boots up, uh, which is not actually all that easy to do, and it's quite expensive. So rather than do all that, I'm using VirtualBox. So we will run through the installation. As you can see, VirtualBox is booting up now. And uh, what I've done here is I'm sped up the process, uh, but just so to make it so you don't have to watch process bars. The first step is to select the installer. Now, it doesn't matter whether you install using the graphical installer or the non-graphical installer. It's really a matter of personal preference. It makes no difference. Now that VirtualBox is booted up, we choose our regional settings. In my case, Australia, uh, because I live in Australia. Next, we select our Ethernet interface. In my case, uh, it's doing this by default because it's running on VirtualBox, but on your laptop, it will be a little bit different. Um, you'll be presented a screen to choose between your Ethernet adapter and your wireless adapter. Uh, don't use the wireless adapter. It will not work. Um, you'll be able to boot the machine up, no problem. You'll be able to log into the Proxmox web page, but you will not be able to launch any machines against it. So just use the Ethernet. Unfortunately, that's the only option we have. Next, we need to give our machine a name. As this will be representing the first Proxmox server in our cluster, I'm calling it Prox1. Then we issue a domain name. If you have a domain name, you can put that here. In my case, my domain is fitsimmons.com.au. This is quite important because when you install Proxmox, uh, it will register an SSL certificate against your domain name. Now we create a password for the admin account or the root account, uh, and we create a new user. In my case, I'm just going to call it Prox with uh, an appropriate password. Now we select the state we're from for time zone settings. Now I'll skip forward a little bit to where we set up the disk partition. I'm going to use the entire disk and just go through the default. So it will just continue on until we're finished. Finish setting up the partition and yes, make changes. We skip forward quite a bit to where we select our package manager. You may not be presented with this screen. This only seems to happen when you install on VirtualBox. Uh, any case, if it does happen, say no, because you're going to remove the reference to it later anyway. And now we need to select our Debian APT server. So in my case, I will select Australia and the Debian.org APT server. And if you've got a proxy server, this is where you will install that information. Now we've skipped forward quite a way again. Uh, next, we need to decide whether we're going to send information to Debian. In my case, I'm selecting no. Then we go through and install the relevant components. And all we need to do is install SSH and other tools, that's it. Now, depending on whether or not, or what type of hard drive your laptop has in it, you may or may not be presented with this next screen. It's pretty straightforward, just follow the instructions that you see in front of you. That's it, the installation is finished. Just click finish and it will complete its installation process and we can move on to the next part. Okay, so first thing we need to do is set up our machine um, with the specific settings before we install Proxmox. Now, as I said to you a couple of times, we're going to actually change the setup of this operating system so that, it, because it's running on a laptop, so that you can close the lid without it shutting the machine down. Now, before we do that, we need to be able to find the IP address and log into the machine to do changes. Uh, now, at the moment I'm using VirtualBox instance, but pretty soon I'm going to switch over to one of the laptops. The process is the same, no matter whether you're using a uh, Proxmox operating system instance or you're using a laptop. The only reason I'm going to show you this step 
on um, an operating system instance running on VMbox. It's just because it's a lot easier. So we'll log in. But now that we've logged in, we've got to find the IP address of this particular machine. Uh, now this process is exactly the same no matter whether you're using a VirtualBox instance or whether you're running it on any other kind of uh, PC hardware. Um, so we need to find the IP address. There's two ways of doing that, or mainly there's two ways of doing it. First one is to log into the router and then figure out which MAC address belongs to your particular PC, then look up the IP address relevant to that. Um, but this way I choose is a little easier because I don't know what router you're using. So if I try and explain it using my router, chances are you're going to have a different set of instructions and I don't know what your level of skills are, things like that. So what I'm going to do is just show you how to do this from the Linux terminal itself. You just type IP ADDR, my prizes for guessing what that stands for. And when we hit enter, we can see we've got a loopback um, adapter at the top. And then our Ethernet port, which is ENP0S3, has an IP address of 10.110.10.106. And all we need to do is go to PuTTY, type in our IP address 10.110.10.106. Six, hit enter. Now on your machine, you should get a certificate. Uh, don't worry about that in this case, because I've obviously logged in before. So now we just log in as prox, and enter our password, and there we have it. And now that we've logged into our machine, we can start making some settings changes. First thing we really need to do is uh, set a static IP address for this machine. Um, and normally there's a couple of like tutorials on how to do this on the on the web and most of them suggest using the sudo command. The sudo command won't actually work yet so what we're going to do first is set up our static IP address and then we will install sudo. But to do that we actually have to have elevated privileges and there's a simple way of doing that is just to use the su space minus command and then it asks for a password which is the password we set up for our root user because you can't actually log in as root as part of uh, this part of the process. It's a security feature that prevents you from logging in as root when you're using PuTTY uh, when you first set things up. But as you can see here, um, we, we have now got a root prompt appearing uh, on our login. So by using the su space minus command, we're actually able to tel uh, telnet across to the root uh, terminal session. 